Coming up on Network Africa. Burkina Faso loses 11 soldiers in an army base attack. At least four migrants drowned, 10 others missing off the coast of Tunisia. Plus, Mozambique detects its first case of polio in decades. Welcome to the program. I'm Layo Olaride. We begin with updates of attack in Burkina Faso, where the military says it has lost 11 soldiers during a strike on its base in Majauri in the eastern region of the country. A statement by the Armed Forces Communications Unit says at least 20 others were wounded by shrapnel or projectiles and are currently receiving medical treatment. In the meantime, no group has admitted responsibility for carrying out the attack. Burkina Faso's army says its military air support killed at least 15 militants who were attempting to escape after the attack. It's also urging all the units to maintain a spirit of combat readiness to defeat what it terms as the enemy. Burkina Faso has been battling an Islamist insurgency in the north since 2015. The UK Home Office says legal challenges against its plan to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda have not delayed the scheme, but some British media outlets are quoting campaigners as saying they received notice on Wednesday evening that the Rwanda flights will now not take place until at least after June the 6th. A Home Office spokesperson is said to have uh, s said the first flight are expected to take place in the coming months and legal action has not yet had any impact on this. Prime Minister Boris Johnson had last week told the Daily Mail newspaper that he hoped the first flights would happen within a fortnight. More people have been notified that they could be sent to Rwanda under the £120 million scheme, people deemed to have entered the UK unlawfully will be transported to the East African country where they will be allowed to apply for the right to settle. Staying with Rwanda, the U.S. State Department says it has determined that Paul Rusesa Bagina, the subject of an Oscar-nominated film Hotel Rwanda, was wrongfully detained. Mr. Rusesa Bagina was sentenced to 25 years for terrorism by a Rwandan court last year in what his supporters call a sham trial. He is credited with saving some 1,200 people during the 1994 genocide and his actions inspired the film Hotel Rwanda. His family says that it hoped that the new designation would bring increased pressure for Rwanda to set him free. In a statement, they said that the 67-year-old the 67-year-old's health is deteriorating and they fear that he would die in prison, especially if something is not done by the United States and others to free him. Last month, the family filed a $400 million lawsuit in the United States over his alleged abduction and torture. In North Africa, at least four migrants have drowned and another 10 are missing after their boat sank off the coast of Tunisia. The Tunisian Coast Guard said they were attempting to cross the Mediterranean into Italy. The boat, which left from the coast of Sfax, with more than 50 migrants on board, all of Tunisian nationality, sank off the coast of this port city. That's according to a spokesperson for the National Guard. In the meantime, the Coast Guard says it managed to rescue 44 people from the overcrowded boat. The city of Sfax is one of the main departure points for Tunisian and foreign migrants, particularly from sub-Saharan Africa to the Italian coast. The rate of illegal departures now is likely to increase uh, as the summer approaches. 
Well, still in Tunisia, thousands of Jewish pilgrims have gathered on the Tunisian island of Jebra to visit one of Africa's oldest synagogues in an annual pilgrimage following a two-year suspension due to COVID-19. Pilgrims usually travel each May to Giriva Synagogue on the island in the south to mark a holiday which follows Passover. The pilgrimage has been taking place for 20 years and in the past has attracted visitors from Israel, France and the United States. Mainly Muslim Tunisians has one of the largest Jewish Many, mainly Muslim Tunisians has one of the largest uh, Jewish communities in North Africa, about 2,000 people, and half of them live in Jeba, close to the Libyan border. In Sudan, tear gas filled the streets of the capital Khartoum as protesters rallied against the country's military rulers. The protesters have been calling for a return to democratic rule. Protesters, hundreds of them, continue to stage protests and stage walks in this seventh month of their demonstration. Demonstrators marched in the Sudanese capital Khartoum. I miss heavy security presence, including the U.S.-sanctioned Central Reserve Police, which were deployed at key points along the protest route. Some threw tear gas canisters back toward security forces. They are back to the old tactics used by the regime of former President Omar al-Bashir, which is to attack protests at the meeting points before they move. But this will not stop us, and they know this. A military coup in October effectively ended a 2019 power-sharing deal between generals who overthrew President Omar al-Bashir and political parties that opposed him. One of those parties, the Sudanese Communist Party, said its leader, Mohamed Mukhtar al-Khatib, had been arrested on Thursday following a visit to Juba, where he met with leading Sudanese rebel leaders. The party, which has been the most hardline against the coup and any future deal, was pursuing a unified front against the coup. Protester Fati expressed concern about the military oppression. This oppression is irresponsible and not right, no matter what. Sudan's economy has spiraled as its government has gone without a prime minister since January. Businesses are stagnating while citizens face steep increase in the prices of food, electricity and fuel. To some health matters now, U UNITAD celebrates its 15-year anniversary during the World Health Assembly, which runs from, the, uh, from May the 22nd to the 28th of May 2022. On the African continent, Kenya has been one of the quickest countries to produce and scale up first in-class life-saving technologies for HIV. In this country, where nearly 1.4 million people, including more than 80,000 children, are living with HIV, active steps have been taken over the past 15 years to facilitate the introduction of access to advanced medical technologies at affordable prices, making it possible to roll back the HIV epidemic. UNITED has been involved in pediatric HIV since its creation in 2006 from the scale up of uh, early infant diagnosis of HIV, the introduction, which means the introduction of DNA PCR testing for children to identify children. It has also been involved in the development of pediatric uh, drugs, uh, reformulating new drugs uh, over the last 15 years. Children by their very nature grow very quickly and, and treatments need to be adapted for them. They need to be easy to consume. Now, UNITAID is, is perhaps the only global agency that's focused on ensuring that we can have 
these new treatments, treatments, uh, the newest treatments adapted for children as early as possible. And, and, and not just uh, on the market side, but also in the scale up in countries working with governments. There's a big difference between giving the children the Lopinava Ritonava tablet or syrup compared to the Dolutegrava tablets, 10 mg. Before the children had to take twice a day. If it's Lopinava Ritonava, they had to take in the morning and in the evening. If it's the syrup, it was not palatable, it was bitter. The taste would remain for several hours, but with DTG, they're only taking it once a day, and it's not as bitter. It's very sweet. The World Health Organization says Mozambique uh, has declared a polio outbreak after detecting its first case of the virus in nearly three decades. That marks the second imported case of wild polio virus in southern Africa this year following an outbreak in Malawi in February. Polio invades the nervous system and can cause irreversible paralysis within hours. There is no cure for polio, but infection can be prevented through vaccination. WHO says the latest case was found in a child living in the northeastern Tete region who began experiencing the onset of paralysis towards the end of March. Consultant public health physician Dr. Doni Oguyemi joins us now on the program for discussions on this. Thank you, doctor, for speaking to us. Thank you for having me. Let's begin with what's the implications of this case. Uh, what are the implications of the case found in Mozambique? It's the first of its kind in nearly three decades. Okay, so let's... Um go a bit into the historical perspective. Um, so the, the entire Africa, the last case was in Nigeria um, in 20, 2020. I'm sorry, 2016, it was, Nigeria was, you know, among the countries that were finally um, given the certificate of being polio free. However, um, that means that polio is no longer endemic in such countries, meaning that um, it's only, perhaps you may have imported cases. So Africa as a whole has you know, been free for the past almost five years now. So if we found this case in Mozambique, it's worrisome, um, but it does not make us lose that status of um, being declared polio free. Now, there, there are two types that we could find. Is either we find the wild polio virus, which is very concerning, or we find the one that is a vaccine derived, that's the circulating vaccine derived polio virus. So in the case of the one in Mozambique, it was imported and it's been linked to um, coming from Malawi. And the one even in Malawi was linked to coming from Pakistan. So let's recall that there are still two countries that have not eradicated polio virus. That is Pakistan and Afghanistan in Asia. Be that as it may, it is troubling to have um, the virus coming into the country as an imported case because spread can occur um, even without any symptoms. So what do we need to do um, as, a, as all countries? So we have never stopped advocating for routine immunization. So what we have to continue to do is to keep our infant immunization rates high. That means children under one year should continue to get their polio vaccines um, at birth, six weeks, 10 weeks, and uh, 14 weeks, that's four doses. But apart from that, we should continue to have our national immunization uh, days. And um, all of those times where we give children under five years uh, the polio vaccine, irrespective of their vaccination status. And I'm aware we're doing that um, in Nigeria, particularly in Lagos State, one just uh, took place. Also, we should continue active surveillance. By that, I mean, let us keep checking for cases of acute flaccid paralysis, or even loss in muscle tone in any child below 15 should be reported. 
Then environmentally, let us take two samples from the sewage, you know, even where there is two samples indiscriminately, such samples should be taken randomly and sent to the laboratory to check if there's a polio virus there. And then from time to time, we should continue to do our mop-up campaigns. If we can keep the herd immunity high, that people that are immunized, even if you have an imported case, is not likely to have um, enough strength to go from person to person. So we just have to um, continue everything we have been doing and never right. stop. Why I am a bit concerned is that um, where you have conflict situations or insecurity, and health workers are unable to go to hard to reach areas, especially rural areas, then it becomes yes, it's, a problem. It's quite difficult to, to reach those people when there's their are conflicts, yes. I'm so sorry to cut you short, Dr. Doing, but you've touched on, you know, other questions that I wanted to ask, but we have to take a break at this time. And also thank you, Dr. Doing Uguyemi, consultant, public health physician. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Still ahead on the program. Our Africa Tech segment, uh, we see a Nigerian lecturer that builds a solar-powered electrical vehicle. Please stay with us. Welcome to our Africa Tech segment. 48-year-old Chinedu Umosu is a lecturer in the engineering department of the Federal Polytechnic Nekede Imo State, where he's built a solar-powered electrical vehicle. Chinedu says this achievement has been a dream of his for many years that has finally come to reality. According to him, 70% of the materials used in producing the electrical car were local content. The Federal Polytechnic Nekede, located in Oweri, West Local Government area of Imo State. And this is where Chinedu Mosu works as a lecturer in the engineering department. The passion and dream of many years has finally come to reality for the 48 years old lecturer, whose skills and knowledge in mechanical engineering has finally resulted in the production of a solar powered electric vehicle. The new rector, uh, engineer Dr. Mike Adamawa, has always been interested in uh, uh, the school going for alternative energy, alternative source of energy. One, to power the school. Two, to replace means of transportation in this place because what we are presently using now is causing a lot of harm to the environment. So I approached him, I told him about my dream. So he said, okay, form a team. And we formed a team and we approached him. He gave us a lot of support. Chinedu says about 70% of the materials used in producing the solar-powered electric vehicle were sourced locally, and he tells us more about how he was able to manufacture the car with such materials at his disposal. There are some basic materials you know that we have available here. Some few ones that are not available because of the scarcity, we were encouraged to look for alternative locally. Because of this car, didn't go using the conventional uh, 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 materials they use in making other motor cars. We used cow hoof and bamboo. We grinded this into powder, and the same thing with the bamboo. Dry bamboo that is ready to be wasted and burnt. We grinded them, added some binders, and casted this. We formed a mold that gave us this shape. A member of his team, Korea Vincent Ibabuchi, who worked on the electrical aspect of the car, also sheds more light on the production of the vehicle. We were able to develop a quick charge system for the electric vehicle, which uh, enables the vehicle to charge within 30 minutes, once the battery is fully drained, because this is one of the major problems of electric vehicle, how to charge. If you are charging via the utility, you, are, you, you should be able to charge the battery in less than 30 minutes. Otherwise, the, the rate at which a regular, a regular combustion vehicle engine is uh, fueled will outmatch the performance of you trying to charge the vehicle. So in this particular context, we were able to design our own uh, charging system, which delivers about 1.5 kilowatts power to the battery system. 
With the financial supports given by the management of the Federal Polytechnic Nekade and Tet Fund, Chinedu was able to produce his first solar-powered electric vehicle. Chinedu believes the solar-powered electric car will reduce the transportation challenges within the Nekade school community and help reduce the hazards faced in the course of moving from one point to another. Firefighters in Somalia's capital, Mogadishu, have battled for about six hours uh, a fire that engulfed a market in the city overnight. Banadir Market is one of the biggest shopping areas in the city centre and is close to the mayor's office. The fire set to have started in the early hours of Thursday and was not extinguished until after midnight. However, no one was killed in the blaze, uh, believed to have been caused by an electrical fault. Prime Minister Mohammed Hussein Rubble has expressed his sympathy on social media to the traders who have lost their properties and posted photos from the scene. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni says talks with Kenyan presidential candidate Raila Odinga has touched on issues concerning the two neighboring countries after they met at State House in Entebbe. Mr. Odinga considered one of the front runners in the August 9th presidential elections had paid a courtesy call on President Museveni. In a tweet about meeting Mr. Odinga, he said both leaders walked down memory lane to discuss their shared history of their countries and their aim at forging stronger ties in the future. Two days ago, Mr. Odinga was in South Sudan where he met President Alvarez and commissioned the 3.6 kilometer freedom bridge that is expected to ease transportation of goods across the River Nile. However, a record 55 presiden presidential candidates have been cleared now to contest in Kenya's election that will be coming up later this year. And finally, on the program, have you ever imagined taking part in the hot air balloon sport? Well, let's meet Semakaleng Matebula, who is a South African first black hot air balloon pilot to shake up the exclusive sport. Take a look. 27-year-old Semakaleng Matebula is South Africa's first black hot air balloon pilot and one of few female pilots in the field. What used to feel like unattainable is now part of her weekly routine. Growing up, I had never seen a hot air balloon. There's no balloons flying over Harangua. Um, my interests were cooking, accounting. Um, at some point, I wanted to do media. But ballooning was not something that was in reach for me. Soon, buildings grew small and she was floating over rivers and farmlands as the sunrise maneuvering the balloon and taking in the view against a yellow sky. Matabula found her way into ballooning by accident after struggling to find employment. She consulted a recruitment agency which helped her find a job as a marketing assistant at a hot air balloon tour company. She was smitten. Um, when I was introduced to the sport, it was this new and exciting field. And when I found my feet, I realized it goes beyond marketing. Um, you found me on the field trying to retrieve and crew with everyone else. You found me in the kitchen trying to make sure the guests are eating and they're all happy. And then when the opportunity presented itself by the scholarship with the Department of Sport and Recreation and the Balloon and Airship Federation of South Africa, BAFSA, all the pilots put my name forward and I applied and here I was being a pilot. She started to learn about the sport and later got a scholarship to do her pilot training from the Department of Sport and Recreation and the Balloon and Airship Federation of South Africa. She earned her license last year. Coach Flip Stein believes more young people should be encouraged to take part in the sport. We really need new blood, you know, younger blood in the, in the, the sports thing. 
because a bunch of us is growing old and uh, we need to get new people in and this is why it's so nice to have people like Sema and some of the other kids that's trained now and busy training you know because it's new it's not just new opportunities it's new viewpoints and new aspirations and, and stuff like that and we need to be able I think years back ballooning was a very exclusive club whereas now it's becoming more open and open Matabula also said she's keen to be an ambassador for the sport and hopes to bring in more youth and diversity. She will compete for the first time in the South African Hot Air Balloon Championship in June. It would be nice to take a ride in that hot air balloon. That's how we end the program today and for the week. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm Layo Olaride. Bye for now.